Good morning, Antioch. How are you guys this morning? Everybody looks mostly bright-eyed and awake. Mostly. It's been an interesting week with the snow and the sun and the snow and the sun. <laughs> but it's good to be here. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So if you guys would please stand up with me. We'll say a prayer here and uh, play some worship songs here. Get our, get our hearts right to the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this time this morning. We want to pause again and just thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. Thank you for the weather this week. Thank you for the time uh, to come here this morning. I uh, pray for those still on their way, that they would make it here safely. I just ask that you would help us as we start off this week to put aside those uh, troubles and the things from last week that we continue to, to think about and those burdens that we still have, that you would help us to work through those. Help us to lay those down this morning at your feet and uh, just accept what it is that you have for us. You have so many blessings for us. Just help us to accept that. Help us to see what it is you have for us. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you this morning, Lord. Lord, we lift this up to you. We lift up this offering to you this morning. In your son, Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like 
That was one from a while back. <laughs> but it's a good one. It's a good, to, good reminder of what to focus on. If you're not sure what to do, you focus on whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is lovely. Focus on the Lord. for this next song to uh, go over the lyrics. Nancy, if you could put the lyrics up there for the next one. It's called Jesus Loves Me. Some of you may be familiar with this song if you've heard it on the radio. But it starts off, I was lost, I was in chains. The world had a hold of me. This is a, this is a testimony song. As we sing through this, so I wanna know who, who's been lost? Have you been lost? Have you been in chains? Who's been in chains? The world had a hold of me. Has the world had a hold of you? Now the thing is, when the world has a hold of you, it doesn't mean that you don't like it. It doesn't mean that you're resisting it. As I've heard some stories, and people, you know, even people that you know, they're like, they're in the world. Ooh, they love the world, what the world has. The world has a hold of them. But they're not, they're not fighting it. 
They're walking around lost and in chains, like I imagine a lot of us were. We've been lost, we've been in chains. Uh, the next one, the next words there. My heart was a stone covered in shame. Has your heart been a stone? Have you guys been there before? Maybe even now some of you are there. Lost, in chains. Well, the word says in Romans that uh, when God came for us, the next line, when he came for me, we were, I was lost, I was in chains. When he came for me, it says in Romans that while we were, we were sinners, that Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, you know, how, how much more then when we're on our knees in front of him asking him to help us, to save us, if he did that even when we were enemies, very enemies of God. So as we sing this this morning, if you've been lost, if you've been in chains, if the world has had a hold of you, when we get there, lift that up, lift that up to him. When he came for me, because he loves me, because Jesus loves me. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And he loves you too. <laughs> he loves Amen. Breath 
those surrounding me I can hear the sound of nations rising up we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome no we won't I can walk I can walk down this dark and painful road I can't face every fear of the unknown I can hear all God's children singing out we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose Jesus from the grave the same power that commanded death and death lives in us lives in us the same fed hen and rotund hen, so obviously I've done, done an adequate job training, you know, I mean, because we get two different answers, but that's okay. Where'd Fred and Angie go? See, guitar man and bass woman, that's how when I say I go, guitar man and bass woman, thank you. Appreciate you being there. Glad to have them there. Here's what I would like to do. Um, you're going to need your Bibles. I found out they were handing out outlines that I'd ran out. Usually we have those afterwards if you want them. Uh, now I'm going to be conscientious. Do I stick to it or not? Because I don't always roll where I've had the notes. The notes are to help me, you know. 
And I already know I want to start somewhere a little bit different because it was something I didn't think about as early when I was working on those earlier this week. A lot of things going on in the news, but there is one that I wish and I believe, uh, except that I believe in a big sovereign God who makes no mistakes. So since he makes no mistakes, then, you know, it's the way it should be. But in my heart of hearts, I think there's somebody who should be getting a whole lot more media time right now because of what he contributed for 99 years than the media, you know, seems to be playing. Who am I talking about? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. I understand that he has spoken to more people via the media, at least as far as we know, and then face-to-face -face with his, uh, you know, come in for a week and, and gospel evangelistic meetings than any other single person has ever done in the history of, of mankind. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you can qualify that or not for sure, but I, when I heard that, I thought, yeah, sounds reasonable to me. He spoke to a lot of people. Somebody told me, and I don't know if this is, remember, Wikipedia knows everything, right? And so does the Internet. When, whenever in doubt, just go to Wikipedia or, or the Internet, and you're bound to get the straight dope. But, uh, but one or the other, someone told me, said that, that uh, with his conferences, he spoke to almost 200 million people. And I just thought, that's a lot of people. Now, here's what went through my mind when I was thinking about him. Actually, a lot of things went through my mind. But one of them was, who is Mordecai Ham? Yeah, that's the brother that led Billy Graham to Christ. And I thought to myself, there are superstars, even in the Christian world, or at least people that are perceived that way. And there are people that are viewed, I guess, as poppers. Most of us are poppers, at least even in, in Christian people's eyes. And yet I thought to myself, I wonder if God's going to have a different opinion on how he sees Mordecai Ham, who I'm sure is already with Jesus, when you realize it took Mordecai Ham to explain the gospel to somebody who'd already gone to church, religious, just wasn't a Christian, he comes to Christ, and who knew what in the world God was going to do with that individual? My guess when he, I understand he was 16, and I'm no Billy Graham scholar. I just uh, admire him. I remember when, uh, I remember when, when uh, I was in Spokane, and we had one of his crusades. And one of the things that I picked up as I was, you know, getting ready for that was that a group of media people had uh, taken cameras up to a room and had some, you know, a woman in there planted and walking around with him trying to see if he would, and, there, and it was like, yeah, he's a pretty straight arrow. He wasn't willing to bite on any of that stuff. And I thought, why would you do that? I mean, what compels you to see somebody who is actually doing something right and think, I wonder, let's see if we can pull him down. That's what this world needs, right? We don't need people that do it right, so let's figure out, you know, there's got to be something wrong with what they're doing. There's got to be a shtick somewhere. All right, I thought about that. I thought about the superstar and the popper, and the reason I thought about that is we're going to look at another superstar and another popper, in this case, in this case it was a husband-wife team, uh, and yet both of them end up being remembered by God Almighty, which I think is pretty cool. Because it says to me, whether you're perceived as a superstar or a popper, as long as God's the one that keeps the books, it really doesn't matter what people think or don't think. It really doesn't. I thought of one other thing, because it lends itself to this text, these verses we're going to look at. And I'm going to try and stay pretty close to the text as we work through. But I thought, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in the inside of one of Graham's confer uh, conferences or not. I remember it was either Oakland or Candlestick Park. It was the Bay Area. I went to my first Billy Graham conference. And all I remember was every seat was packed, and I remember the choir going, just as I am, you know, without, I remember that song. And I remember when he was preaching, I remember I'm a brand new Christian, been a Christian probably less than a year, which means I know everything <laughs> about Christianity. Just ask me. 
Uh, don't ask me what books are in the Bible. Particularly don't ask me about Old Testament books where the pages still stick together, but I know almost everything. But I remember when he was preaching, I was sitting in the chair, and I thought, that's it? I mean, I was waiting for a message that was going to have like 14 points of profundity, you know, and I'm thinking, this guy, God's used this guy to shake the world. And it's like, boom, 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 y'all come. Boom, 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 it's time. If you came with friends, leave them alone. And I sat there, and I'm sitting there thinking, where's the profundity? And, and then what really hit me was he was profoundly simple. You know, he wasn't simplistic. It means you don't think. But he was profoundly simple. He was able to take a very complex message and lay it out in a way that you would go, I get it. That's hard to do. And he did it well. And I remember when I'm sitting there after I've been thinking about, you know, where's all the profundity? And then I see all these people come pouring out of the stands. And I'm just going, holy smokes. This really is a work of God, isn't it? But see, here was one of the things that I knew uh, from the Spokane situation. And then when Louis Palau came in, did almost exactly the same thing. You see the one week of conference. You see the one week where you hope you can find a... Uh, parking spot, a chair, and you hope that your friends, if they're not Christians, would be willing to go with you. Or if they are Christians, that they'll go just for encouragement. Right? It's powerful. Here's what you don't see. Graham moved his team in one year before the conference ever happened. And we met weekly for a year. And they had materials for... Have any of you been through this? Am I the only one in the building that's been through this? Maybe I am. I'll give you, give you the straight dope on it. He had handbooks of question after question after. We're going to set up phone banks because people are going to start calling in. And these are the questions they're going to be asking. And you've got to have answers. So you can know the ones that you know, but they're alphabetized. So when they start asking you stuff you don't know, because nobody can anticipate all the questions, you roll to this. And then here are Bible verses that go with it. If you were going to be allowed to be a counselor there, they had four or five basic lessons. How to become a Christian was one of them. Uh, how, assurance of salvation, how to know you're a Christian was one of them. What to do as a Christian when you fall on your face and you need to walk through forgiveness, but you feel very unworthy and like you've so let God down, he probably isn't going to want to talk to you anyway. In other words, there were four or five, and if you didn't, come to the classes and master those, you did not get to be a counselor. It just wasn't going to happen. And then the churches that they would funnel people back to. I'll tell you an inside secret. If they weren't evangelical, they didn't get people funneled back to them. If Jesus is a nice guy, but no more. The Bible's a nice book, but no more. All you have to do is meditate and think on your own reality. And as you create your own reality in your mind, you can make it so. That's, that's Gnostic nonsense. And there's still Christians that believe that. There are probably people that aren't Christians that believe that, but you got Christians more. You create your own reality. If you can, if you can make a positive confession of something positive that you want to happen, if you make it, God is obligated to make that happen. Now if you make a negative confession, the negative things are going to happen and, and, and God again is going to make... See, God is obligated to let you create reality. It's not just Zen Buddhism. It's not just Taoism. It's not just some of the Eastern religions that teach that. There are Christian churches and Christian speakers that teach that. And folks, that's nonsense. At least if you want any kind of biblical basis for it, it's nonsense. And one of the things we're going to find out is the reason we're here today is because you had people who absolutely understood that there is a book that stands supreme to the books. And as long as you're consistent with the book, you really are not going to go very far wrong. And as soon as you feel the freedom to start walking away from that book... I don't know. Who knows where we'll end up? See, Graham made sure when he came in that people were trained. Or they weren't involved with the crusade. They could come. They could sit up in the stands. And I think sometimes it's so much easier to look at the, the fruit and go, 
Man, all he does is open his mouth and everything happens. Well, that's true. Man, the Spirit of God really used him. That's true. But the Spirit of God using him as an evangelist and him sending teams of people in a year before and training them to be ready for what was going to happen, they don't have to be played against each other. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can actually be both of them work very well together. And that's what I think we're going to see with the text today. Let's see. Uh, as I was looking at the text, the first thing I thought about was a question. And I don't remember if it was Uber Pastor or Jonathan. It was one or the other. It was either Rainey or Jason. And I don't remember. But one, maybe you will. Um, but one of them asked, how was it that Paul was comfortable to either leave people behind or send people ahead? And who was, do you remember? I, it was one or the other. I was sitting right back there and I thought, man, that's a great question. I know where they're going to go. At least I thought I knew where they were going to go. See, Paul trained people. He had Pauls and Silas's and Timothy's and what that he poured himself into so that he could either say, you stay and I'm going to head to Athens because that's what he did in chapter 17. You guys stay behind. I'm heading for Athens. And then at one point or other, I'm going to give you a call and then you come join me at Athens. He does the same thing here where he left Timothy and Silas in Macedonia. He takes off for Corinth. And then at one point or other he says, hey, y'all come. You know, need to see you. But while he is in Corinth and doesn't have Silas and Timothy with him, it says in verse 2, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They were tent makers. They ended up spending a long period of time together. And I thought to myself, how would you like to be a tent maker that got to work every single day with Paul? What do you think he talked about? See, what got me thinking about that was when he says, I'm heading to Syria. That's what he says later in the verses we had last week. I'm, I'm, I'm heading to Syria, but I'm going to make a stop in Ephesus. But Priscilla and Aquila, I'm taking you with me. And it's while they are there that Paul says, I want to get back to Antioch to give news, but how about you guys stay here and keep doing what you're doing? And that's when the superstar is introduced. His name is Apollos. But as we're going to see, he's got a couple of poppers that meet him the first time they listen to him speak, and they're going, and he's eloquent, but there's a problem here. And I thought to myself, Thank you, Paul, that once again, before you took off, you had trained people to do what you can do. That was his M.O. I'm not going to take the time to read these. Shame on me, because I think Nancy put them up, but I'll, well, maybe you can get these. I put Acts 5.42, put them all in Acts. There's stuff about Bible training and teaching all through the New Testament, but I thought if we put them in Acts, maybe you're more apt to stay and read them, because you can just stay in one book, you know, and keep looking. Acts 5.42, after the action has happened, what do they end up doing? They kept right on what? 14, 21 and 22. After they had preached the gospel, the city and had many disciples, they returned to Lystra. We went through that, Iconium and Antioch. We've preached through that already. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying there will be many tribulations, many tribulations will enter the kingdom of God. What do you think they were talking about when they were strengthening and encouraging? You got started. Now let me tell you where the minefields are, you know, so you don't get blown up as a Christian. I, I want you to succeed. It's kind of like John in 15, 16, where he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. You know, I appointed you that you would, what, bear fruit. There was the evangelism for John. And then make sure your fruit can remain. There's the training. Don't, don't just, Billy Graham didn't say, y'all come, I'm out of town, I'm going to my next one. He had things set up, churches ready, people trained to absorb people to come in. It was way more than just the show that you saw during the one week. It was a lot of work. Getting, oh, that sounds so unspiritual. No, because you're asking the Spirit of God to prep you and prepare you so new Christians don't hear, be warm, be filled, and good luck. Isn't it way more fun to be at the 
week conference than it is to be going every single week to meetings, you're going to get this question. Here's how you respond. You're going to get this question. Here's how you respond. They're going to ask you this. Here's what you say. Man, you're making this like homework. Okay. Be warm. Be filled. Don't worry about reading the Bible. Just trust the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you anyway. Who needs the Bible? Just good luck. Those folks don't survive. At least not many of them. How about 27 and 28 in the same chapter? When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began reporting all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the what? What do you think they were doing in the long time that they spent with the disciples? Folks, they were teaching. They were training. How about 15, 1 and 2? Some men came down from Judea, began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Well, you know, all opinions are equally wonderful, and we're all part of the same church. So, heck, you know, if you want to tell people you have to be circumcised and keep the law to be a Christian, that's fine. We don't truthfully believe that, but, but it's all okay because, you know, we're gentle and loving, and we're going to make sure that nobody's feelings are hurt. What does it say Paul and Barnabas did when people were sharing something that wasn't true? They didn't ignore it. They dealt with it. Now, you have to know something to be able to deal with something. Clearly, God had been teaching them so that not only could they teach and train in things that are positive and fun, but when someone stands up and says something that isn't correct, they're able to go, got an issue here. Isn't that what Priscilla and Aquila did when they're listening to Paulo's preach? I think we're going to get to 25 and 26 and see that. How about 1535? I want you to understand we're not making this up, just trying to make it work. It's there. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch teaching, preaching, many others, the what? They stayed there and they kept on preaching and teaching. He was traveling through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. It's all about getting saved. No, it's not. Getting saved is step number one. I'm in a new relationship. How many of you that have been married? Let's, I'm, I was, I was going to say 25, 30, 35 years. That used to be normal. Now that's seen as really novel. But let's just say you've been married more than, uh, more than uh, five years. How many of you knew everything you needed to know about marriage? First week you got married. You ever want to get a redo on some of that stuff? Yeah. Or how about child rearing? I can't tell you how many times my two older brothers said they got cheated because the parents had learned on those two, so they had it right for the two young ones here, you know. You don't know how tough it was for us. I go, I can't do anything about the birth order, brother. I'm sorry, you know. But I'm, I'm guessing people learn. How about in your job? Man, you've been at your job 30 years. You know more than you did the first week you came in. First week you go into a job, sometimes it's like, what? How about with Jose? Troy, playing baseball. Troy, are they any better by the time they get to the big leagues than they were when they were in little league? There's a learning curve in there. See, it's seen as normal and part of the process. I think with the Christian faith, most anything, you see the same kind of a learning curve. And the longer you're at it, the more effective you ought to become. That, that should be seen as normal. They were feeding it and feeding it. How about 18, 7, uh, 1711 and the 1823? Now, these were no more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. That was a good church. We preached on that. They received the word with eagerness, examining the Scriptures when they felt like it, <laughs> when they could work it into their busy schedule of things that were already way more important. I said when I happened to be preaching that section, that was my turn when we hit that one, and uh, uh, I just said, you know, it went way beyond convenience. And I also said, you can't give what you don't know. You can't share what you don't have. They were studying to see if what was being said was so. 
Having spent some time there, chapter 18, this is where we enter today, he left and passed successively through Galatia. We already talked about the churches that he would have been dealing with there, right? Antioch, Pisidian, Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. Doing what? So he goes back through strengthening all of the what? Nah, it's just get saved, got your insurance, and go to heaven. You know what that same person says? My faith is so boring. You're right. It is. I wish God would use me. I wish he could. Well, the Holy Spirit lives in me. Yes, he does. He can teach me anything he wants. Yes, he can. But what he teaches is going to be consistent with a particular book. And if you don't know what that particular book says, it's pretty tough to cough out of you. Well, haven't you ever been in a situation where he just gave you? Absolutely. Happens to me preaching. I've written a number of books. Some of you know that. That's not a big deal. I've written stuff and afterwards I said, God, I know that was you because I wasn't smart enough to come up with that. I mean, I've, I've watched that work. But generally, the Spirit of God doesn't work out of an empty vacuum. He works out of people who remember like a 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not have to be ashamed. One who can rightly divide. It's our word for exegete. Ex one who can rightly divide the text. When I read verse 23, let's start walking. Actually, I'm going to have to start skipping. I would say running, but I don't run anymore. I waddle. So I used to be able to run. Now I waddle. And having spent some time there, here's Paul again. He left, passed successively through Galatia region and Phygia, strengthening the disciples. I just thought, it's the same song. It's the same song. And yeah, Bible study is so boring. I don't believe that. Well, it's all about Bible study. I don't believe that either. I can lock myself in a room and say I am the world's greatest Bible scholar, which anybody arrogant enough or stupid enough to do that, you know, it doesn't take very long for we all... You know, I remember when I ran into John G. Mitchell my first year of Bible school, because like I told you, after one year of Bible school, you know almost everything. And especially if you've taken any Hebrew or Greek classes, I mean, that makes you just darn near omniscient, you know. <laughs> and, and, then you, and then you run into somebody like John G. Mitchell. Unbelievable. We used to try to trick him. I think I told you this one time. We would try and trick him with Bible verses. We would take Bible verses we didn't even know. We'd say, Dr. Mitchell, you know those uh, verses in Leviticus chapter 6, uh, verses 12 and 13? Guy, well, what are those? I don't have any idea. Just watch. He'll know. Can you tell me what those mean? I'm, I'm not making it up. He'd just sit there and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. Because he called us laddies. He'd say, well, laddie, and then he'd just start quoting right through the verse. Now, what's the problem with the verse? Has his Bible, didn't even turn to it. Well, what about over in 2 Timothy chapter, you know, well, laddies, hmm, 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 hmm. you know. We did not stump him once the whole year in class. We tried. Now you can say your motivation stunk, and I'm going, you're right. But uh, it did. Somebody wanted to stump him. I went into that class going, man, compared to my friends, I know so much. And then after I looked at him, I say, that's just kind of an indictment on who my friends are. Because once you, <laughs> once, once you run into somebody like this, you kind of go... You feel about this tall and go, I guess there's still more the Holy Spirit can teach me. I mean, even after one year of Bible school, my goodness, you know, I go, when you go home to give a report, you don't tell them that though. You just wax eloquent about everything you've learned. You just don't tell them about a John G. Mitchell and go, yeah, there's still room to learn. I asked him one time, I said, how do you memorize so much scripture? I'm not saying this is the same for everybody. Navigators would absolutely disagree with me on this. It's a fine ministry. I said, I walked up to him after class. I said, how do you memorize so much scripture? He said, I never once sat down to memorize a single verse in the Bible. And I said, well, we've not been able to catch you Old or New Testament. You know them. And he said, laddies, I just read it and read it and read it until it just runs through my head. 
And then he said, I still remember this, he said, I always buy five copies of the same Bible when I go change Bibles. And I said, why? Because he said, as I'm reading, I can see on the pages the verses, but if you get different translations and the verses are on different pages, it can confuse you. So he said, after I wear one Bible out, I get another one. I've got five of them where everything will line out the same way. So as I keep reading, and he said, once you start reading, how about on a novel? You read a novel, yeah? Do you memorize the novel? No. When someone else starts talking about that book and fouls the story all up, can you say, I don't think that's how it went. Didn't it go more like, yeah, I've done it, I can do that. He goes, you aren't trying to memorize stuff. You just became so familiar with it that when it didn't flow that way, you're going, something's wrong here. Our brains are a lot sharper than we think they are. I'm looking again and saying Paul was consistent. In chapter 18, he's training two people, two tent makers. I don't think he knows in chapter 18 at the beginning of it that when he's going to take off for Syria to get back to Antioch and he's going to leave them there, I don't think he knows anything about verse 24. Paul wasn't omniscient. He was faithful. What do you see in verse 24? A Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. Paul takes, isn't that just like God? Out goes Paul, in comes who? Apollos. I mean, if we lose so-and-so, and if we, I mean, church is doomed. I guess if God doesn't care about it, I guess that's true. I think we're all expendable. Every one of us. God, God can get stuff done with us or without us. I think he'd rather get it done with us. But anytime I start thinking I am, I am not expendable, I go, God says, son, I'll pat you on the head, little boy, because clearly there's something you've missed. You've missed it. What do I learn? Alexandria was the leading academic center of the world. That's just a fact. 700,000 books in their library. We found the library. As far as we know, it was the largest library ever been put together. He's grown up there. Philo, brilliant philosopher. Some of you had philosophy classes. To this day, you can still read Philo. I've got Philo in my office. I can sit down and read Philo. Was in all likelihood Apollos' trainer. He was a bright bulb and and Philo was the head of the philosophy school there, just like you, when you would say in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Corinth for the 18 months, who's the headmaster? You'd say, well, that was Paul. You would have said the same thing in Alexandria about Philo. We find out that, at, that uh, Apollos was a lawyer. We're, we're told that in another text. Trained as a philosopher, trained as a lawyer. But it said he was eloquent, and he was mighty or powerful in what book? Apparently he was very well read in all of that. But what it does say, he was an eloquent speaker. And he was mighty in the... That's what it says. So apparently with all of his learning, he did not walk away from what book? And at that time it would have been what? Old Testament. Because we didn't have the New Testament at that time, right? powerful in the scripture. Now I thought about this. I don't have any one of you that have walked up and done this to me, but I feel it sometimes. Um, and I know it happens because I was part of it. I already told some of you, I, I, I spent between two and three years in a, in a group of reformed theologians whose job it was, our job was to go into every church and tell people how little they knew. We were a blessing that could split any Bible study up and start our own. Our Bible study started with two, me and my roommate, who were certain we knew more than everybody else. And after we would go in, we, it was packed house. Packed house. Every Friday night, packed house. We both had one year of language. Man, that makes you darn near a scholar when you're less than 20 years old and you've already had a, you know, a year of Hebrew and a year of, year of Greek kind of thing. We would pick off people and get them unhappy with the studies they were in by proving how much more we knew than they were. And after a while, we had a whole room full of people that were just angry. Smart Alec. Knew it all. Say, Carl, you ever notice how they kind of reflect the two people that are leading the Bible study? 
Does God really give things to us so we can turn around and burn things down? So I've learned as an adult it's a lot easier to burn something down than it is to build something up. Or put it the other side, it's a lot harder to build something up after you've burned something down. See, it was all about education in our group. It's all about what books you've read. It's all about how much you know. What happens about how you live? How come you can know it all in your head, but you're not living it? If you're not living it, why should anybody care what you know in your head? But see, the other side of the coin, it's just all about how you serve. Really doesn't matter what you know or don't know as long as you serve. Really doesn't matter what you share or don't share. Someone will clean up your mess because it's just all about service. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, 1 through 4. Paul says, brilliant man, but he spoke in a very simple manner. Apollos was a brilliant man, but he spoke how? Eloquently. Did God say that he liked the simple man more than the eloquent man? Or the eloquent man more than the simple man? Both of them used what they had been given, and they were very effective with it. Why play service against learning, learning against service, simple against eloquence, eloquence against, they got different people, different gifting, and guess what? Just like Paul was a gift to the church, Apollos was a gift to the church, Peter was a gift to a church, I pray to God they don't try to be somebody they're not, just be who they are, because we've got things we can glean from each one of them. Now again, if you're thinking this, you've been too kind to me. I mean, I appreciate this. No one's been in my face, and I don't walk away from very many fights. I mean, I'm, I'm just not kind of wired that way. But if one of you, we'll just put, I really like that Jonathan Rainey, man. I really like that Uber pastor. I really like that Carl. I really like that Luke. I really like that Mark. If I forgot anybody, it's not on purpose. I go, why would you ever want to play one person against another? What if God knows enough about them that he says, you know, they're wired different, but that can be a blessing? See, when the Corinthians played Paul against Apollos against Peter, and then the most self-righteous group, we follow Jesus. I go, no, you don't. You know how I know that? Because you put yourself in one group that says, we don't work like these guys do, we just... We're actually smarter than they are. So what you have is four different groups, each following their hero. And Paul says, schemata, you've divided the body. It means division. You've frayed the body. What are you doing? You like Paul better? Good. That doesn't mean you can't learn from the others. You like Peter better? That's great. You like Apollos better? He was eloquent, man. Paul was really smart. Peter was Jesus' favorite. Well, we're the ones that are the most spiritual because we just follow Jesus. That's right. And you have your group right here and you don't let anybody else in it because your group is more spiritual than their group, which means you're dividing people just like anybody else is. One family, one body, lock arms. He was eloquent. That's great. You know what I learned from verse 25? This man had been instructed. It's an English word for catechized. He'd memorized a catechism. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, been fervent, meant boiling hot. I like that. The word fervent means boiling hot. This guy was passionate when he spoke. This man had been talking about Apollos. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So we know, probably came from his being mighty in the what? Old Testament scriptures. Jesus knew the scripture. Apollos knew the scripture. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, boiling hot in spirit. He was speaking and teaching how? The things concerning who? But he was only acquainted with who? He wasn't even saved yet, folks. I thought, what an example of somebody who can know the Scripture, teach it accurately, and yet knew nothing about death, burial, resurrection, coming of the Holy Spirit. It says the only thing he was familiar with was the baptism of John, a baptism of repentance. I baptize you with water. The one who's coming is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
I am not worthy to untie the thong of his shoe. Apparently, some of John the Baptist's disciples got into Alexandria, Egypt, and ended up teaching this guy. And he was a great student absorbing everything that he could get. And since all of that came out of what book? Old Testament. This guy takes his lawyer training, his mind and all the rest, and dives into what book? And he becomes an expert mighty in what book? But as Priscilla and Aquila are listening to him speak, they're going, no, we're missing something. The word accurate meant more complete. More complete. As he was speaking boldly. Now I thought Christians have to be, do not have to play passion against humility. You do not have to be hiding in a house to show that you're humble. You do not have to be passive and mute. It's actually okay to open your mouth and speak. Well, doesn't that make you look arrogant? Only if you don't know what you're talking about and you're trying to blow smoke past people. Most people would like to have good answers. That's usually why they're asking you questions. He began to speak out boldly where? In the synagogue. Why? Because that's where they study the Old Testament. And he was a what? Jew who was familiar with what teaching? John the Baptist. Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They took him aside, explained to him the way of God more accurately, meant more completely. Now, here's what I noted. They did it privately. They took him aside. Paulus, that was a stupid thing to say while you're teaching up there. What kind of learning you got? See, we just spent 18 months with Paul. We're tent makers, but man, we got discipled by, well, the best would have been Jesus, but, you know, two, number two might be Paul. You know, someone might argue Peter. I mean, that isn't what he told us. Why don't you sit down and shut up? They pulled him aside because they loved him and they cared about him. And privately it says they explained to him the more complete message. That's when he finds out about death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And I believe it's why he says, look at the next verse. When he wanted to go to, okay, that means go to, go to um, Corinth. Remember, they're in, they're in Ephesus. Paulus wants to go to Corinth. The brethren encouraged him and wrote, apparently he made a heck of an impact on the disciples at Ephesus because they're sending notes to the disciples in Corinth and saying, listen to this guy. This guy's got a lot to share. Welcome him. When he arrives, he greatly helped those who what? Believe through what? See, I think he was so appreciative about another message. I understood the repent, walk righteously, maintain the law, because John was still teaching that. Messiah's coming, you want to be ready for him. I think when Priscilla and Aquila explained more accurately the way, it was a word that meant devotion, it was a word that meant lifestyle, and it was a word that meant doctrine. When they explained the way about doctrine, devotion, and lifestyle more accurately, uh, actually Messiah did come, buddy. John's, John's disciples didn't catch that part. You missed that part. It's all about, for by grace you are through what? It's a free gift of God. It's not by works, at least anyone what? I think he's going zippity doo da, Man, thank God for those tent makers. Who do you think got the headlines everywhere Apollos went? Say Apollos. He did. When you're eloquent and mighty in the scripture. But you know what I thought to myself? He was also humble. He's willing to get pulled off the stage by a tent maker and say, you really need to listen to what's going on, bro. We love you, but there's something you've really missed. See, I still think somewhere in the one who keeps the actual record, I think in the same way that, remember Ananias? Paul, the killer, knocked on his rear end. He's met Christ. Ananias, I want you to go, you know, he's he's blind right now. You're going to take care of that. Lord, he's the one that kills us, you know? See, I see him like Mordecai Ham. How many of you remembered Ananias? Not many of us. I'll bet you Paul never forgot him. 
How many remember Priscilla and Aquila? Probably not many of us, honestly. We didn't happen to be reading this. I bet Apollos never forgot them. And I bet God never forgot any of them. They gave what they had to what? They'd been trained and they gave away what they had to give. If they hadn't been trained, they wouldn't have as much to give away. Oh, that bookworm, he always, when I was, I had someone, uh, I had my car, went to the car doctor this week, and uh, I had to drop my car off, and then Zeke, God bless you, rescued me. Thank you, brother. Even when snow was starting to come down, and his car is not one built for snow, and I'm thinking, please, God, don't let him get around a corner and be snow, because he hung around to wait for me. But I walk in there, and I've got stuff, because I'm prepping on this. Guys, I use my time. If I'm going to be sitting in a car lot, I take my notes, I take my book, I'm reading, and I'm taking notes. I'm not wasting that time. See, people say women can multitask and guys can't. That's not always true, right? Some of us guys can do that too. The guy walks out and he goes, well, bookworm, you need a ride? I said, yes, I do. Thank you very much. See, it's just the attitude. If you're going to study, somehow that makes you not relevant. Tell Apollos that. He was a scholar. He just knew how to lay it out simple. Tell, or that what Paul did, Paulos, scholar, he just laid it out eloquently. They probably appealed to different people. As long as everyone gets the message, who cares? Well, you know, no one wants to be the kid in school that gets the best grades. I do. <laughs> now, you know, get, get, remember in eighth grade when I tried to do poorly on a test because the kids behind me were really cool and I wanted them to like me and they'd always go, man, you always get the answers right. So I screwed a couple of them up on purpose. I thought they'd go, well, now you're one of us. What a stupid thing to do. But as an eighth grader, it made sense. Johnny Carvalho, he died of liver. He was, he was already an alcoholic in eighth grade. How about that? He died of cirrhosis of the liver. But I wanted him to like me. So I'd miss a few questions, let him peek over my shoulder. He didn't make it out of high school before he died. We do funny things. Nothing wrong with having something to give away. Just don't be snotty doing it. It's no more biblical to be all about books than it is to be all about service. God nowhere plays one against the other. They're supposed to be two sides of the same coin. Eight, what did Apollos do? 28, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public demonstration by the what? That Jesus was the what? See, I love my hobby horses, don't you? Let's talk about spiritual gifts. Let's talk about spiritual warfare. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that. If you're, if you're with uh, Kip Keenan's group, let's talk about Acts 2, 38 and 39 because it's all about baptism and how you're baptized and where you're baptized, what church you're baptized. You see, some of you don't guarantee you're on an active college group. They know who he is, Church of Christ, Boston Church of Christ, or now Church of Christ International. Uh, if, if, if I got J-dubs coming to my door, man, they're going to tell me how Jesus died on a cross, and, on, on a pole instead of a tree, which is nonsense, but someone told them to say that. They say that and... And it's not. You know, if, if I'm a Mormon, I've got five steps to my salvation. Jesus is one of the five steps. If you don't get all 100% of it, you're out anyway. See, I'm saying there are people that are very sincere and very religious, say things. Thank God you have someone like Apollos that says, from the Scripture, let's just walk through this and see what it says. But to be able to walk through the Scripture, you have to what? Know the Scripture. If you don't know it, how do you give what you don't have? You know what this message is about to me? This message to me about Matthew 28 when Jesus said, go therefore and make what? It was about 2 Timothy 2.2 2, when Paul says to Timothy, the things that I've shared with you, these entrust to faithful men who will do what? Give it away to others also. I thought Mordecai Ham got it with Billy Graham. Apollos got it from Priscilla and Aquila. Clearly, Silas and Timothy got it from Paul, and we get to keep rolling. Have you been trained to give something away? If you have been, who are you giving it away to? 
If you're not being trained, why not? If you're not giving away what you've been given, why not? I don't know as much as Paul did. Never will, I'm sure. I didn't get three years with the Lord. That's quite a tutorship. I probably don't know as much as Aquila and Priscilla. I didn't get 18 months with Paul. But it doesn't mean I can't give away what I've been given. I know John 3.16. Then be mighty in the scripture with John 3.16. But be smart enough to know there are also questions that come up other than John 3.16 that can belt a lot of people. And we live in a culture that understands that very well. And we look at Christians bailing out all the time. Why? My thought, I'm more concerned about can I empathize with you and feel what you're feeling in my heart and not worry about what the text says and I am saying I can love you to death but you know what? I can't undermine the text. Can't do it. Study. And then give away what you've been given. I'll quit with this. I wrote down study, stand, and serve. Those were my three S's. Study, stand, and serve. Father, I pray you'd use this time to your glory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.